There we go. Good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome. Welcome to the scripture habit. Welcome to this space where our whole goal is to help you develop that habit of getting into scripture every day. It is a habit that'll change your life because that's what, that's what God's word does. Yeah, I know I say that every time because it's true. My name is Rebecca. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here and I say welcome. It's an honor and a privilege to get to be a part of your journey into scripture. It really is. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I'm going to wait just a second for friends to join us in the live to let me know that the signal is good, the audio and video and everything is coming through fine. Let me know. I just changed uh, Wi-Fi, so that should be better. There we go. Oh, good, Susan. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, friends. I hope you're having a good day. <clears throat> We're going to wait just a second for friends to join us and jump on. <clears throat> Sorry, I got some in my throat. Felt like I just did like a soda commercial. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> hi, Brenda. Hi, Georgia. Good morning, guys. Okay, let's do this. Let's pray. And then we're going to read our scriptures today. We're only doing six verses of First John chapter 2. Only six. Let's dig. Yeah. Hi, Judy. Good morning. All right. Oh, we love you, Lord. We do. God, we love you. We celebrate you. We honor you this morning. Thank you for a new life. And the Holy Spirit that you give to us, you transform us, God. Thank you. Speak to us through your word. Holy Spirit, help us receive the word of the Lord. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Beth, hey! Oh, that's great. I'm so excited to see you, friend. That's so cool. <laughs> All right, we've got six verses today. Only six, but they pack a punch and so we're not, yesterday we were able to go through the whole first chapter of First John. We're not today, only the first six verses. Let's look. Here we go. Uh, by the way, I put this kind of summary. If I were to sum up First John, this letter, this, you know, pretty short letter, I would say that <clears throat> this letter is written helping Christians avoid traps and to help them live with confident faith and relationship with God. That's kind of like my summary. Hey, Gloria. Hey, Stephanie. Joanna. That's so awesome, guys. Hi. All right, here we go. Um, just to remember, <clears throat> excuse me, this letter is written by John. Uh, we gave more information introducing him to you in yesterday's video. So if you missed it, I'm going to encourage you to go there. Uh, won't have as much time to talk about it today. But it's written by John, and he writes differently than Paul. He does. And so a lot of the, the letters and stuff that we've looked at recently have been written by Paul. John's a different guy, all right? Uh, he is writing specifically to a church that has, it's the early church, and they've been experiencing division and fractions. And um, one commentator I know, they, they use this word, attacked from within, this phrase. I, I really like that because it was from false teaching people taking their understanding of Jesus and adding stuff to it, you know, or maybe they, they just thought, you know, oh, I'm just going to say it like this or add it like this. And they didn't understand that they were changing the message of the gospel. And when you're changing those details, you're changing the gospel. For example, this idea, um, interesting back then, <clears throat> They never questioned, like it wasn't a question or an argument that Jesus was divine, that Jesus was part God. Why? Because there were so many miracles, so many things that were just evident of God's manifestation. What they did question, what some did wonder is if he was even fully human. That was a heretical teaching that was coming into the church when they're saying, I wonder if Jesus was really in the flesh. Maybe he wasn't really in the flesh. Maybe he was like all spiritual being. That's heretical teaching because Jesus had to become fully human as well as fully God. He had to be fully human to stand in our place. Yes. So it's things like this. You know, sometimes we might say, well, what's the big deal in that, you know, little thing or that question? But it has big implications spiritually. John knew that these types of things were dividing the church. People were getting upset or leaving over it. There's, there's hard stuff. And I would say we experience things like that today too. He wrote this letter to encourage them. Let's dig in. First six verses. 
Hi, Gloria and Flo. Good morning. All right, here we go. Verse one of chapter two. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. God's commands. This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I've come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. That's all we're reading today. I know. Only six verses, right? Um, The thing about John, he is, he is deep. He is deep. Like, I feel like he crafts his words in a way where there is so much there for us to try to dig apart. So yesterday, though, we went through a whole chapter of 1 John, 1 John 1. Uh, We are not going to be following that habit of one chapter every day. We're just not because I don't want us to miss this, miss some of this stuff. So we're going to start here. Let's go back and let's look at verse 1. Let me grab my... There we go. All right, verse one says this. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. If you remember yesterday when we read 1 John 1, John pointed out this idea of sin. In fact, I I even put it on the screen, actually. Let me go back to it. Uh, Verse John 1, 8. If anyone says he is without sin, he deceives himself and the truth is not. Oh, I meant in him, not in us. Yeah. The truth isn't in him. Verse John 1, 8. If he says he doesn't sin. Here's the thing. There's this, I I don't know, it's balance, act, understanding, you and I as Christians, we have the we have had broken the power of sin and death, the curse of sin and death. That's been broken over us. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. We are not hopelessly lost in sin anymore. In fact, you and I, through the power of Christ, we have the ability to rise above sin. We have the ability to turn away from sin, yes? And we want to do that. Why? Because we know that sin separates us from God. Sin creates a barrier. It's a space where sin is us saying, I want what I want and I don't care what God wants. I'm gonna put my needs, my wishes, my desires first at the expense of God and the people around me, right? We know that that separates us from God. And so as Christians, we don't want sin, right? But at the same time, at the same time, the only perfectly sinless one is Christ. It's the only one. So there's this balance, this question about like uh, sin and not sin. We don't, we want to avoid sin at all costs, but we're We're not perfect at it. We're not. And so John, he talks about this idea, right? Like if anyone says that he doesn't sin, that he doesn't have sin, uh, like he's perfectly kept the law, then, then God isn't in him. Why? Because you need to know that you are a sinner and that you needed a savior before you can accept Jesus, right? Right. Um, But even after for us now having accepted Christ and the curse of sin is broken. And yet, what are you and I supposed to do? Because we don't we don't do it perfect. John is John is hitting on this. Now, what I will say is um, the curse of sin and death has been broken over us through Christ, through the cross. That does not give us a blank check 
to keep sinning and say, oh, well, I'm under the grace of God anyway. So it doesn't really matter. That is not it either. And so John's going to hit on both of these ideas. All right. So I put there sin in the life of a believer. And we talked about that. This idea that sin, it, it is a reality in the life even of a believer. But we have a different opportunity, a different path. All right. And so that's why he says, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Right? Jesus is our advocate. And then in verse 2, he himself is. And the CSB, the Christian Standard Translation, which is the one that I use the most, it says he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Some translations will use this uh, very technical word called propitiation. That means this atoning sacrifice. Atoning means it's like the payment for, full payment for the sins that were committed. Jesus himself is our advocate, and he was the one that paid the price for our sins, right? Before we flip flip back, I want to look at verse 1 really quick again. He says, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. Again, that's our aim. That's our goal. That's our hope is that we don't want to sin. Another reason I point this out is because if we think about what this church was going through at the time with division, with false teaching, John is writing them to try to correct false teaching to prevent them from falling into sin through it. Right? Just pointing that out. Okay, verse three, oof, this is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands. This verse, uh, this idea, this phrase, like I feel like it, there's so much depth to it that the, it is possible that we can take this verse and possibly misapply it. And here's what I mean by that. Um, we are saved by grace right? This, what Jesus brought in was this awareness that the law, the commands of God, which were given, we see them in the books of Moses, right? First five books of the Bible talk about law, commands of God. And then what we see in the rest of the Old Testament is the, the story of humanity who fails miserably at trying to keep God's law. Even good people are not perfect at it. Right? I can't think of any one example in the Bible of someone that did not um, react or respond or get angry or fall. Like, like getting angry isn't sin, but like what you do when you're angry is sin. No one. I mean, even Esther, like I think of Esther. There's, yeah, I, th- I, think, I think of it. Like that there's no one that perfectly obeys the commands of God. This verse here, if anyone, you know, how do you know that you know him? You'll keep my commands. And Jesus said that, if you love me, keep my commands. We do not want to create a misunderstanding that our relationship with Jesus is earned by us following all the rules. Because guys, that's the old covenant. That's the old way. God first gave these law. Now listen, the whole purpose of him giving the law was not so that people would be perfect in keeping it because again, he knew that we wouldn't. But he was trying to teach this understanding of all falling short, right? And then he was trying to teach this understanding about why we needed him to step in as a savior. It's this journey of love and getting to know someone because God wanted to continue to give us free will too, right? So this command command thing, where I see this maybe go a little south is um, when people get very legalistic. When people regulate others saying, you know, you, you have to do these things. You have to do these things. Um, I can understand why they, why they get that. Because this verse, at first glance, could look at it. But that's not actually the message that John is saying here. 
Look at this again, okay? This is how we know that we know him. First of all, he's talking about you evaluating yourself, all right? You evaluating yourself. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commands. I put a few phrases in the study today. To truly know God means... And we're going to break out a few things that he points out from here. To truly know God means that he has written his commands on your heart and his instructions deep within you. Check this out. This is Jeremiah 31, 33. I put the NLT translation here. This is a a prophecy, a word from God. This is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. And I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Did you know that when you accept Christ, when you develop a relationship with God, he writes his instruction within you. Like he puts his instruction deep within you. He writes his commands on your heart. Such an interesting imagery for me. Um, Before, under the old covenant, God's words were written out as law, right? And how would someone know the law? Well, they had to read the first five books of the Bible, the law, right? Uh, This idea now is that God puts within us, like deep within us, this awareness to his instruction and his command. You're going to care about things that you didn't care about before when you develop a relationship with God. And I just love that imagery. This is the first part of it. So he he puts his instructions deep within you. It's like in you, this different desire than you had before. And he writes his commands on your heart. Yeah. All right, here we go. The very next verse, the one who says, I've come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. Why does he say this? Because again, we're not, we're not perfect. We're not perfectly able to keep God's law, but this isn't talking about perfection. Why does he say that if someone doesn't follow God's commands, then he He's a liar. He doesn't really know God. Why do you think that is? When I think of relationship with God, and and this is why I like that, that word relationship, because I think of my husband and I, you know, I think of the relationship that we have had over the last, you know, now 21 years, right? Gosh, I feel old. Um, 21 years. We have been in relationship and commitment with one another. There are times that I can look back and I can see where I was very selfishly motivated and I didn't consider him in a decision or something, right? And there are other times where maybe I feel like I wasn't considered. And that hurts. Why? Because you're in relationship. So what one person does, the other person walks through too, right? Relationship, this understanding, this commitment is that I'm going to consider the other. I'm going to care about their needs. I'm going to actually put their interests ahead of my own. That's what happens in relationship. And so John is pointing out here, hey, if you say you know God, you're trying to say you're in relationship with God, but you don't care at all or consider him, You're not really in relationship, friend. You're still all about you. You see that? Isn't that good? I love it. So to truly know God means that you know and love him enough to be intentional with the things that he cares about. It doesn't mean that you're perfect in keeping the law because only Jesus can perfectly fulfill the law. However, your intent and your heart is committed to an honoring relationship with God. In those moments in my marriage where I feel like, oh, I missed the mark. I I did something and I didn't consider him, you know, and I hurt his feelings. Or if he did vice versa with me, because we're in a committed relationship, we recognize that we failed. 
We recognize that we put our interest ahead of the other person and we go and we apologize, right? We apologize and then we make this intention. I want to be better at this because I know it matters to you, right? This is what John is saying. You're going to care about the things that matter to him. And that's what God's commands were. It's teaching us what matters to him. Is this making sense? Is this hitting differently? I, I want to show that this is different than being legalistic about God's law. This is different. It is not the same thing. But you're going to care about what God cares about when you're in relationship with him. Okay? And then the last one here, verse 5. Uh, but whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. Keeping his word, meaning um, trying to care about the things that matter to him, the, the things that matter to God, God's word, keeping God's word, all right? So whoever, oops, I don't know why I just did that. There we go. Whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. And this is how we know we are in him. Here we go. This is how we know. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. This is how we know that we are in him. John so far, all right, in the beginning of, of this chapter, very first thing he laid out was that Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. In fact, without Jesus, it would be impossible to even have relationship with God. We would, and, and at the end of chapter one, he was talking about fellowship with God, right? Fellowship. And now he's saying it's only because of Jesus that that fellowship with God is even possible. But let's evaluate, let's assess, let's consider what that really looks like. He points out to know him. To really know God means that God's word is going to be written in your heart. His commands, his instruction, he's put it deep within you. So you're going to care about it. You're going to care about the things that matter to him. You're going to have a different awareness than you used to. And then second, if you know God, if you really know him, that means that you are going to care about the things that matter to him. And then this third one, he says, uh, this is how you know that you're in him, that you're going to walk as Jesus walked. What does that mean? We say, right, like a disciple is basically like a student of the one that they're following. And they literally attempt to walk where this teacher walks. They want to go the same way. When I think about Jesus walking, and I think about even my life, like what, what my own journey has been with God, it's been, it's been a process because in the beginning, I would say I knew of him, but maybe I, I didn't really care about his commands very much, right? And then I started to care. God started shifting my heart. I started to care about his commands in a way that I never used to, right? And then it became more than just his commands and his instruction. Then the relationship started to grow. And I, I wanted to care about the things that matter to him, like in a broader sense, not just am I obeying or not, but like this broader awareness. I want to care about the things that matter to you, God. And then this third step. This third way, this awareness, not just that I know his commands, but I actually care now about the things that matter to him, like his view, his perspective. Now I want to walk it out. I want to walk the way Jesus walked. That means I want to care about what moved him. Sorry for hitting that. I want to care about what moved Jesus forward, and I want to follow his model. I would say for me, in my journey with God, those have been three different points in my relationship with him. Three different like moments of awareness. First, caring about his law or his commands, not wanting to mess up, right? But then beginning to hear his heart, caring about God's heart. And then this last was like, Lord, I want to live. I want to put my life doing things 
that follow you, that, that are what you would do if you're here. You know, I want to walk the way that you walked. When I made that decision in my life, it changed a lot of things. It really did. And it, it was, I would say it was not something that I could have forced. But it was just this development of God working in my heart. I started to care less about following my own path. And I started to care more about wanting to honor him with my life and be a part of what he wants to do. Do you see that? Do you see these three different things? These three different moments? I wonder what those moments have been like for you. And I just want to encourage you. John, when he's speaking these things, he is wanting to, um, again, he said it a second ago, I'm writing these things so that you do not sin. Writing these things so that we can have fellowship, we can have unity with one another and with him, right? And guys, this is just the beginning. This is just verses one through six of First John chapter two. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. We find hope and encouragement in your word. We find challenge in your word. God, thank you for the journey that you bring us on. You begin to awaken us to give us a sensitivity and an alertness to your heart, to the things that matter to you. God, I pray that none of us, anyone that hears my voice, that we wouldn't get um, stuck in only caring about obeying and observing your commands. But that that's just the beginning of knowing your heart and then walking with you. Help us, Lord, we pray. Help us, Lord. Awaken us. Show us, Lord, how to walk as you walked. We ask in your name. Amen. 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 All right, guys, that's it for today. Do me a favor. Hit the share button. Can you do that? Listen, um, our, our goal is to really help as many people as possible to develop this habit of getting into God's word because I know, and if you've been with us any amount of time, I feel like you know that when we get into God's word faithfully, it changes our life. It does. That's what God's word does. He gave it to us for that purpose, right? Invite someone in on that journey. You'd be surprised how many people believe in Jesus and they know scripture even, but they might not have developed this habit. You can be a part of that. Say, hey, come on this journey with me. Yeah. All right. Have a great day, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.